Hey, everybody. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Nice way to start it off. Jeez, thanks for checking out my weekly stream. Uh, I probably should have done the P5 faux fun before I started talking. Um, I got my water with me, luckily, so shouldn't be too much of that. Uh, as the title says, day 281-ish. Started, started this rebuild of my project this year, January 2nd. That's the time I did the first stream, the first Saturday. Now we're in like the 41st Saturday, I guess, in a row. So luckily I've been able to keep it going. Uh, the plan is probably close to the end of the year, maybe end of November or end of December. I'm going to release something and maybe we'll have like a little release party video stream slash thing. And I'll post it to a couple places and I'll keep an eye on it and try to maybe post some articles around it too. And, and at that point, maybe I'll shift the stream to not like a maintenance mode, but I have a lot of other things like it. that whiteboard in the middle, the post-its are the things I'm hoping to get done for the end of the year. So everything around the whiteboard, all the, you can't see some of the post-its because of the microphone, but let me try to guesstimate. I have like 45 things to do after that. So maybe at the end of the year, when I release it, I'll take all of those outer posts and I'll start moving them into the, the focus area of the whiteboard. That's the way I do it. And then when I finish them, I, Put them over there so i've finished quite a few and it, <clears throat> it looks like a lot it looks like an accomplishment but at the same time if you see those red ones the bugs you know i mean is it an accomplishment if you create 50 bugs and then fix them i'm not sure if you could just prevent just not create them in the first place there would only be one post-it there and it would look less impressive but could be more impressive so i'm not sure how much progress i made but uh i'll let you be the judge let's jump to it <laughs> so this is the app in action. This is where we are right now. Uh, I do have, as you see here, branch 41 for episode 41. Let me zoom in. There we go. So we're going to be going through these 50-ish commits. Not all of them. Some of them I'm have to going to do next episode. We'll get into that. But yeah, let's see where we are now. So we have quite a bit as far as windows go. We got the cool fun little selector. We got the right-click menus. We got right-click on entries. We have a way to reorder the icons. Uh, this is all persistent after reloads. We got our little start menu here uh, with our little animations. <clears throat> We're going to improve these today. For the longest time, I didn't couldn't figure out how to <clears throat> properly do this blur animation, a second blur animation. If you see on this outer one here, it's blurred on this background. But the way that I... <clears throat> had the elements positioned. Uh, this one wasn't properly doing it. So this has the exact same effect applied to it. Backdrop filter blur of 10 pixels, something like that. But you see, it's not blurring the same way. I can clearly read the text. And the reason for that is is because they're, it's like a child of it in the div tree. We're going to fix it this episode. So we'll get to see how I fixed it. That'll be part of the commits. Anyways, we got a bunch of apps here. As you saw, possibly from the screenshot, I tried to update the screenshot for this video to kind of show most of the apps in action. Uh, I realized while I was making the screenshot that the photo app was buggy. I've actually fixed it in this episode. We'll see the fixes, but unfortunately for the screenshot, I didn't show the photo app, which we also have, and I'm gonna do some improvements to today, including uh, <clears throat> fixing pan zoom. But yeah, we got some cool apps in here. Um, I mean, one cool thing about this, you think, oh, cool, he's got Doom. Uh, actually, I have an entire DOS emulator in there, so I didn't create the DOS emulator, but it's it's in there, so you see here it's running Doom, but it could run anything. I even have the ability for it to run zip folders, so let's say I take these two shortcuts and turn them into a zip file here, and then I right-click the zip file and say run it in DOS, and it'll actually run in DOS, and you can see those two shortcuts there. You can actually type them out, probably. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I have to spell it correctly. Yeah, there we go. That's like the content of it there. And I can actually do the same thing in Linux too. Um, but in Linux, I have a virtual mount, fake mount of this file system. So I actually also have an x86 emulator that can emulate any x86s, any ISOs. So let's say we load this one up here and this, and I also have it link in with the file system. In the case of this Linux ISO, it already does some, some proper mounting ahead of time. So if you just, if you just put any OS on there, any ISO, it's not necessarily going to work right away, but we can just CD into the mount directory and we list there and we can see the same content. So where, where how do we get to the desktop? It's like CD users. Oh. 
Ugh, now we're in Linux. CD public. CD desktop. There we go. Yeah, so same thing. There's the Calibri one. So what is it, like cat? Yeah, there we go. So there's the content. It looks the same. But this is in Linux. The other one was in DOS. Let me open the DOS one. So we can like look at the same virtual file on a website. Oh, wow. They both type in the keyboard at the same time. That's an interesting bug. Well, that's okay. I don't think it's going to work the same in both, but it's kind of neat. Yeah, the autocomplete obviously didn't work here. All right, close enough. Yeah, there's the text there. There's the text there. So that's a neat little demo. And there's also a lot of other cool pieces. I have Peak. So you see if I hover over the... Oh, wait, is Peak not working right now? Oh, it's just a little slow. So you see at the bottom there, it'll actually show a little pre a live preview of what's going on. Uh, I think we do some improvements to it this episode. But yeah, that one also showing a live preview. So that's another kind of neat little thing. It doesn't work on every app. There's some limitations to it because of the way it's implemented. Uh, as you saw, I have like compressed file manipulation abilities, uh, the ability to open zip files that I make. You can delete files as well. <clears throat> you can make shortcuts. Let's say we want to make, make a shortcut of this folder here. User shortcuts, we can drag it in here, close this and double click that. Opens up the users folder. I've also got desktop INI support to handle icons for certain folders. So you see certain folders here have icons. There's the desktop. So it's the same exact desktop. If I were to like, let's say, make a file here, you see it creates it there as well. We got the rename stuff working pretty good. Uh, I may improve that this episode. Let me see. Yeah, I think I do. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. See, currently it's not resizing, but I, I fixed that this episode too. I actually have fixed a lot of little bugs this episode, so let's get it. Well. I want, to, I want to say let's get into it, but I'm actually having fun demonstrating it. Hopefully once... Uh, the reason I don't put it public, a few people recently have asked to see it. I mean, it's, it is public. It's on GitHub. You can just, like, build it yourself and run it, just like I'm running it. But as far as putting it on some URL, I've decided to wait until I, I feel like it's it's pretty decently ready. Just so that people can't even, like, oh, you know, this part's not working, that part's not working, because it still has a lot of deficiencies, but I, I've only got, like... 20 or 30 notes left to work on and then at that point it's getting pretty tight so let's see how far we can get today um so yeah this button clears the cache and wipes everything kind of like a reset i'm going to make that a bit more clear with the proper shutdown menu just like in windows just like in windows oops let me click something random here just for the heck of it let's go back so here was the here was the repo for this week that we're going to go through and yeah, with that, let's just move into it. Let's just jump. So first thing I got here, dynamic load photos with fixed cleanup loading. What does that mean? I think this was part of me fixing the photo app that doesn't work. Uh, so a common element in this that I've, I've started doing is you, you go to GitHub, you look at the diff file, you look at the difference change here, the compare, and then I go to the URL and I add dot patch to the end. And that gives you this diff file. I press Control S and then Enter to save it to my desktop. Uh, I go back so that we can look at this thing if we need to look at it more. I'll, uh, I'll actually I'll copy this piece here. That's useful. Then I refresh my desktop because for some reason Windows, it saved to my desktop, but it didn't visually update my desktop. I don't know if that's a Chrome thing. It's something going on with, on with my computer. I don't know. It's not a problem with my OS. So my fake OS would have updated. That's a solved problem. But I, I guess in the real windows, it's not. Anyways, let's jump into applying this patch. So I'll just take a peek at the name here. The commit is like some ridiculously long hash. But because of tab complete, we can make it easier. So I'll say change directory, the C drive slash the users. I'll just type U and then press tab. It's going to do users. Backslash. I'll just do D because my name's Dustin. Type tab. Oh, I'm not default. I press tab again. No, not default user. One more tab. I'm Dustin. There we go. Realistically, if I wasn't explaining it, maybe I would have typed du and then pressed tab. I don't know. Maybe not because I wasn't expecting default and default user to exist. Uh, desktop. And and then the commit. Nine. And then just tab. I don't have any nines in my... Oh, wait. <clears throat> huh. All right. Oh, yeah, because I'm trying to change directories here. Right. Let's change directories first. Okay, now we're on the desktop. Okay. 
I was trying to do more tabs into a file. That was silly. So git apply. And now we'll do that. There we go. Error. Why? No such file or directory. What? Did I move it? Maybe? Photos. Okay, well, photos is right there. So wait a minute here. Oh, right. I'm totally running this in a nonsensical manner. I was in the right directory already. I'm addicted to CD now because I changed the directory. I've just changed directory so many times. Okay, so let's just take the parts here that I, I did in a gibberish format and let's put them all together into something useful. Here we go. That's the pieces in the right place. Puzzle solved. Okay, so we've applied the patch. Let's take a peek at it. Simple enough, hopefully, because I'm trying to explain it here. Let's see what we got. So I've switched the source to be like a an object. Why have I done that? Oh, yes, this makes the URL loading dynamic. Right, so for, for most of the apps, I've been trying to do drag and drop, where you can drag a file on and drop it, and it'll just like switch to the, the, the Apple update, like as if you did file open. Powered by Red Bull, by the way. And, and yeah, this is just a dynamic way to do it. So before I wasn't even looking at source, now I do. And a common theme I f I'm fearing already for this episode is that there's going to be times where like I commit something that actually breaks something, and then we'll have a commit right after that to fix it. I'm hoping that's not going to happen. I'm going to keep an eye on it. But if it does, I'm going to pre-apologize because some of this commit history, unfortunately, is uh, is a bit hectic. But at the same time, it's a good way for us to walk through it and kind of from the brain of a programmer, just, just thinking like what to work on next kind of thing. I guess that's what I, what these commits are is just me like deciding what's interesting in my evenings to like tackle, you know, like, well, this doesn't work or that doesn't work, you know, and trying to solve them. So in this case, yeah, the issue was that the photos wasn't loading, right? Hopefully this fixes it because it was acting really wonky and kept stealing focus. I don't think this fixes the focus issue, but if nothing else, this will allow me to drag images on to reload it. We'll test, let's test it. I was going to say, we'll test it after we commit it, but why? Why wait? So I'm going to get a picture, drag it in here, my background. This is also my wallpaper. Okay, so we've loaded it. Is the, is the focus issue fixed? Let's see. I might have even fixed the focus issue because before this thing was just being abusively taking focus. So let's try another thing here. Let's uh, add one more photo. The only other photo I have. Hmm, what other photos do I have? I have a really old photo of me. I have an old photo of my bedroom. Let's do that when I was a teenager. Nice, that's a classic one. Oh man, that's a crappy kid poster there in the back. But yeah, this is my old computer setup. <laughs> the Xbox and stuff. Okay, anyways, uh, the pan zoom's actually working reasonably well at the moment here. That's interesting that it is because I was having a heck of a time with it earlier. I've ended up switching to a different utility that works a little better. Yeah, it's probably better in the end than when I switched to. Yeah, zoom out, and it's all messed up here. So uh, we'll fix that later. But anyways, let's let's close these and open one. So, so the Photos app is working better. It's, it's not stealing focus. But so we'll open one, and now let's drag this one onto it. Cool. Yeah, that loaded dynamically. Drag this one back on. Okay, cool. I saw a broken image for a second there. and We'll, we'll resolve that another day. Um, yeah, there's not much we can do about that, I don't think. Let's make a note for it. Um, broken. Borken, yeah. Borked image in between. Between loads. Of photo URLs. There we go. I like to make notes of these kind of things and then follow up with them. Uh, I usually copy all the next stream notes into my notes and then figure them out throughout the week. Like, why didn't this work, you know? Anyways, dynamic load photos with fixed cleanup loading. Absolutely. Loading especially. Feel free to leave a comment, by the way. If you like this video, uh, throw me a like. Um, if you want to subscribe, that'd be great. Keep keep apprised and keep me motivated, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that's it. That was that commit. Let's move on. Let us move on. Next commit. Reset on Zoom and fix title updating. What? Oh man, I added a lot of logic here. It's funny because I think I knew a good, good chunk of this. Oh no, I mostly just moved this up. I moved this into a function instead of just having it run on Zoom. 
because I want it to run here and where else? Okay, and in the effect here. Ah, right, when there's a res... Oh, right, so I added this resize observer? I thought I already had that. Hmm. Let's double check the next commit after this. Don't show broken image. Oh, okay, I already fixed that. Dang it. Well, whatever, we'll, we'll, fix, we'll remove the note when I fix that. Don't resize if it's already min. Monitor resize without crashing. What? Okay, let's just try applying this one. This seems reasonable enough. Basically, I just took this logic out here. I moved that condition up slightly. I've reused this now. No, I was already reusing that. Why did I reorder it then? Now translate happens before... Yeah. Well, let's just roll with it. Because we're going to see it's like, oh, look, it's improved. But then in the end, we end up changing it. But the, the rationale behind it requires the path. The journey is the destination, right? So the next commit is, like I said, reset on Zoom and fix title updating. So, right, the issue with title updating was when I was zooming here, it wasn't updating initially. Now when I zoom in, you see it goes right to 110%. And then I zoom out, boom, right to zero. Before that, it was delayed. Like, the first zoom wasn't triggering. Yeah, so that's a lot smoother now. The title's updating as I'd expect. Okay, I'm, ha I'm happy with that. Yeah, and like if we look at it, like I said, I just I extracted the logic out here, put it here. How did I fix the, maybe it was the order was the issue. Set scale first now. Ah, right, I'm comparing new scale before I was comparing the old one, I think. Was I? Yeah, I was using ismin zoom, which is based on the scale but I wanted to know the new scale. That was the mistake I was making. That's why the initial update, update wasn't working. So I turned it into a function now where we pass the new scale. That makes more sense. But like I said, at the same time, we're about to, we're gonna switch to this pan zoom library in the very near, in the distant near future. Oh, did I not note the first commit that I did? Oh, that's sloppy if that's the case. Let me remember the name because I had it copied in my commit logs. So I, I like to make notes of these as well. Uh, let's just delete that broken image thing, because I see I've already fixed it two commits from now. Or one commit. Okay, we got those two in the bag. Uh, I got a message here from Karen Washer Gredzian. I'm not sure if it's just a spammer or what or not, but they said Trump 2024 USA. Uh, hey, why not? Feel free to say that message, but if you're a spammer, I don't know if you added much to the conversation. Feel free to add to the conversation. I don't know what to do with that. I'm okay to say it. I'm I'm Canadian by the way. I'm in Vancouver, so I, I don't I don't care about the American stuff. Don't follow it. I used to at some point, but it's not really on my news my news channels, so they don't talk about it too much in the C B C anymore. And I don't watch the C B C either, so there you go. Uh what's next? So let's fix that broken image. Don't show broken image. Good idea. Yeah, we just put this behind a little back in here. I think before I had source is, is like blank. Even that was not ideal. But this way now, if there's no source at all, it's just not even going to load the image components. So you're not going to see a broken image because there is no image. And we won't even do a patch here. Let's just copy this version. Uh, drag zoom props. I need a lazy way to find it easy. Nice. There it is here. So yeah, we're just going to switch this to that. That's a little safer. And as far as testing it, well, in theory, it's, it's pretty reasonable. I'm not gonna test that one. We got a lot of commits to get through. I'm not gonna test them all. I agree with the logic of that commit enough to commit it, even if it's wrong. On principle alone. That's where if you had tests too, it'd be like less worry, you know? I don't, I don't do that though. I'm half joking. I'm perfectly happy to do tests. Uh, I'm just lazy. Let's just copy this file straight up. This is the use drag zoom, isn't it? Yeah. Is it called use drag zoom? Yeah, I think I think at some point I even renamed that. I'm not happy with that name either because it's more of a pan zoom scenario. So what was this one? Don't resize if it's already min. That's good advice. Let's see what the change is here. So the resize observer, I added a condition here that the scale is not minimum 
Then you adjust the drag zoom to minimum. Wait, what is this? Oh, right. The logic behind this was any resizes on the photo app would cause it to reset. But I'm just saying here, don't do a reset if it's already minimum zoom. Only if it's not minimum zoom, then reset it to minimum zoom. Okay. I'm not even sure what problem that was solving, but that is true. Don't resize if it's already min. Sure. Was that a problem? Uh, I don't know. It's probably for the best. I, I agree with the logic of doing it. How many have we gotten through here? Four? So we got 46 to go. And we're only... How many minutes in? Why did my window go all the way to the left? 20 minutes in, we're already? Jeez. I just talk away. Thanks for anyone that's decided to tune in. Current viewers is zero, but people like to come check it out after the fact, so that's much appreciated. Feel free to leave a comment, a like, a uh, subscribe. Uh, criticisms are good. I, I mean, if you want to downvote, sure. I'm I'm always I'm okay to see a downvote or or like a thumb down, but I always wonder. It's like, well, what what was it? You know, what could I have done differently? So it's like, feel free to leave a comment. You know, I'm not gonna jump on you or nothing. If you got a good criticism, I mean, anybody that leaves a downvote, it's like something must have, have caused that. You know, it'd be good if there was just like many emoji downs you could do to be like, it was boring. It was misinformation or he rambled on who knows okay let's get back to it here don't resize if it's already man i just did that monitor resize without crashing that sounds nice so the resize is currently crashing it why is that let's do it let's apply this patch in this case to try to sleuth out why this thing is foobarred on us i i remember the photo app had a lot of things that need fixing. Luckily, we're going through them. So at the end, we have a pretty, pretty strong photo app. I'm pretty the, like just last night, the app was pretty much done. And I was like, this is a, uh, this app is, is not easy to crash. I mean, maybe it is. I need some QA eventually. In the not too distant future, maybe I'll try to get some people, some beta testers if people are interested as it gets closer to being done. So what did I do here? What did I change? Just this file. So I'm a little confused here that it says I added this resize observer. I thought I already had that. Okay, right. So the way I was doing it before was sloppy. That was the issue. I was just creating this resize observer without the ability to unobserve it. So now what I do is if there's no resize observer, I have two effects I split it into. First, I initialize the observer if there isn't one. I set it to that state. Uh, with its, with its function being just to directly set the minimum zoom. I guess I got rid of that condition. Yeah, I don't know if it was necessary, honestly. It's okay to just like trigger one more time. So any kind of resizes are just to reset the zoom right back to minimum. And then I have this other effect here that it's monitoring the window object for the photo app. So anytime it resizes, it's going to just shrink back down. That's the behavior of windows, by the way. And yeah, that's much better. What was I monitoring before with my resize observer? I don't even know. I don't Oh, Oh yeah. I was trying to do the container that wasn't working. Right. It had to be the window itself. So luckily I know that now. So that's, that's fixed. Next. That's the end of the red bull. I actually started early before the video. So sorry about that. Although I don't know why I'm apologizing. I don't know why you would care that my Red Bull is done. I didn't wait for you to start. So Better cleanup and Monaco fix. Okay, so we moved on to Monaco. Yeah, let's take a break from the photo app. Well, let's demo it then. Let's see what we got now that it's that, if we're taking a break. So we zoom in and then I resize. Okay, cool. That's good for now. Like I say, I'm going to switch to pan zoom library pretty soon. So more improvements to come there. Seems good enough though. Let's move on to this better cleanup. Ah, oh, yes, I'm happy to fix this one. I didn't realize it was this commit. So an issue I've been having for a long time. So let's say we open Doom. Totally works, totally fine, right? We refresh the page. Now let's open Monaco first. Okay, fine. Now try to open Doom. Crashes. Okay. Now I try to open Monaco first. I did a refresh there, by the way. Open WebAmp. Doesn't visibly show. So there's several issues that I realized 
And I finally figured out what it was. The way I did it actually is if you've seen the console here, let me zoom into the console. All right, let me show you the fix and then I'll explain what I did. So the fix was, uh, I already had this idea of a global cleanup function that would take a globals, like things that are attached to the window object and clean them up, kind of clean them up. So the one that the issue was, it turned out was this one called define. So when Monaco loads, it was, go it was changing window.define to be a function that it made. And it seems like WebAmp was looking at window.define first and same with JS DOS before it perhaps defaulted to something else or loaded its own. I don't know what was happening, but long story short, the Monaco define is not good for other apps. So when I close Monaco or actually just after Monaco loads, it doesn't need it anymore. So I basically, once Monaco loads, I just uh, clean that up. I also changed the global cleanup uh, function to be a little more complex. Before it was just doing delete window and then the name of the key. So in that case, window.define. But the way that these window.define was defined in a way where you can't delete it basically. So I've changed it to be this other possible function called reset key that can do an does object assigned to the window and then it overwrites the key with undefined basically. And yeah, so that's the function, but then what occurs when it, when it, on each global is it tries, it sees if it's in window and then it tries to delete it. And if it fails to delete it, it actually causes an error. So then if that error occurs, I catch it and then I just do the undefining it. Other what, uh, and also delete can sometimes return return false and not fail. So in that case, I say, if it didn't get deleted, also reset the key. So if it, it doesn't, it didn't give an error, it didn't throw an error, but it didn't work. It said, I didn't delete it. Then in both scenarios, try to set it as undefined. That was it. That was the only change that was needed. So let's just use a patch again, just to make sure I don't make a mess with any copy pastage. Oh. There we go. I resized the window slightly. Sorry for that. Keep apologizing. I'm Canadian, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Actually, no, I didn't. Maybe that's like the 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 vegan thing. How do you know you're vegan? Then you mention it, whatever. That's I just killed the joke there. That's like the worst way to say that joke. Come on. There we go. So yeah, we saw. I just added define. I already had a global cleanup of Monaco actually. So I was already doing cleanup globals. This function within Monaco. I just didn't know that I needed define as well. And then I also needed to set it as undefined. Ironically, <laughs> define needed to be set as undefined. Unrelated, the naming there, I believe. As far as I know, it's un un uh, it's coincidental. Okay, so wh where did that go? Good question. Uh, Monaco, right, let's do the demo again. So we open up Monaco, close it, now open up JS DOS, and it works fine. Nice. And WebAMP also still works fine. Cool. So now the apps are living nicer in harmony because of my attempt to clean it up. And I, I love doing those kind of little fixes too. These little like, those make it feel like an OS when I'm like adding cleanup functions to apps and stuff. It's like, wait, this is a website? Is it? I don't know. Is it? Is it? I don't think it, it I don't think it is anymore, but we'll see. Looks like at some point I did a package upgrade. What kind of package upgrades did I do here? I think I just ran the basic upgrade command, nothing wonky. Let's do it. We'll just do it on our own terms though. Let's do a yarn outdated and see what we're working with here. Okay. Looks like a lot has uh, needs updating. Let's do it. Yarn upgrade dash dash latest. Hopefully this time it updates the Canary version properly. Cause it was giving me trouble with that the other day where the package file would on Canary versions, it was putting me back to the latest build instead of the Canary build. So I was actually kind of downgrading, not upgrading. Depending on how you see it. But we'll see if it's a little better this time. Okay. Let's see. Let's see what kind of package updates changes we got here. So Monaco HTML to image. This is, this is interesting whenever this updates, because this is improving the, my hovering, those little mini images that get created because they need improvements. There's actually like, I have like six or seven issues with it, but I think they're technical issues. They're not issues with the, the app. 
Okay, a lot of little updates. Looks like some linting stuff changed. Uh, I hesitate to run linting. Let's give it a shot. Oh, ESLint switched from 7 to 8. That's actually a reasonably big jump. That sounds like a major version. So let's, yeah, let's run ESLint. I don't know. That's, oh yeah, that crashed instantly. Failed to load plugin. Extends, yeah. I don't think we're ready to jump to ESLint 8 for some of these extensions. I use so many ESLint plugins that I, I think that's a concern. So let's, let's actually switch that version back. Let's take a peek at what ESLint versions there were and just go to the one right before 8 because I, I have a suspicion that 8 is causing issues. Let's go to this 732. I think that's what I already had. Yeah, okay. ESLint at 732 in the dev. So this is an attempt to fix ESLint. So let's run ESLint again and see if it's a little... Well, it didn't fail instantly, so that's already better than before. Yeah, so we'll leave this as is. I might add this little arrow back so that this line doesn't even say it changed. But we're fine on 7.32.0 for now. Assuming this doesn't fail. Let's see. Let's assume it doesn't fail. And yeah, yeah. Okay, well, those are just... Uh, What are those? Oh, yeah. It, switched. it did do the canary garbage again. It switched my canary stuff back. Darn it. Okay, so that's the next thing we got to do. Sometimes it does that, sometimes it doesn't. That's annoying. That's the, that's the fun of package upgrades. Now we do it the old fashioned way, next at Canary. So that'll get this one, and then we have several others to do here. This one, and I think one more. This one here. Yarn, add this at Canary, and this one at Canary, dash dash dev. That should fix our next JS linting errors, I would hope. Let's run ES lint one more time from the wait, what's this complaining about? Oh yeah, because I never did do that change. That's okay. Or wait, is that okay? Did it make things worse? What happened here? Okay, I did the updates I wanted, the canary updates. And then we'll just put this back. Whoop. Sorry for bumping the mic. Sorry again. Okay, so ESLint's working now. That's good. Now we've done our, our package updates, mostly without breaking stuff. Uh, and we got the latest Canary versions for whatever that gives us. Probably a headache. What did I call this again? Package upgrades. Yeah, that's a good name for it. Package upgrades. I like to stay on the bleeding edge of those. Although, to be honest, I'm not on... Am I on React 18? At one point, I was, but then I switched off of it because it was just giving me a headache. Oh. No, I'm still with React 17. Yeah, 18 I don't think is ready, at least for the amount of things I'm doing. I don't think they've covered some of my wonky edge cases yet, but uh, I think they will soon enough. As far as Next.js, though, I haven't seen a problem with sticking with the canaries, honestly. Although that being said, I've been having a weird issue sometimes with the dev environment, which could be canary related. I'm not sure. Loading status for containers. Right. This is a cool feature that I've added. Um, yeah. So I pass along this function now called set loading to the container components and I let them load the set loading to false when they're done loading, depending on where the positionally in the app they're done loading. So for Ruffle, for, for all of them, Tiny MCE, I needed to do a little bit of nesting tweaking to switch this to a then. In, instead of having this setup phase, I realized I could just do then to get the active editor and then say that it's done loading. So there's a few refactors for that. There's also this loading Boolean that gets passed into the component if it needs to know the loading status. So in the case of the V86 app, why do I need to know the loading status? I'm using the loading status. I feel like I changed that at some point. No, that works. Yeah, so I base if, yeah, it's, that's actually useful, this loading status. I can use this externally and internally. So I can trick by setting loading to false, it changes the visual message on the window to show that it's not loading anymore. And then also I can use that Boolean back around to do an effect based on if the loading inside that component said it was done. 
So it sends it back out and then it's kind of sends it back in, which is, an, is a nice way to do it, in my opinion. But it, of course, it's my opinion. I wrote the code, so doesn't mean it's right. Feel free to disagree. Uh, here's a nice little trick I did for the loading itself. Because the windows have different background colors, some of them are white, some are black, I found this method of doing mixed blend mode difference. So the text on a black background will show kind of white, almost inverted, and vice versa. You know, on a white background, it'll show black. So it's kind of a nice way to get the, te the text that I wanted because this is the loading pseudo image here. So it'll just say working on it, dot, dot, dot. That's how File Explorer shows in Windows. I've decided to use this loading indicator for the Windows as well. Um, that's about it. Yeah, like I say, it's just a, just some refactors so that we can show this loading basically. And I think it's I think it's smoother for people that are going to have slow internet connections once I start hosting this. It hasn't been too noticeable of an effect for me running a local dev environment because everything loads almost instantly because it's all local, but. That's not going to be the case for everybody. So I'm hoping this will improve some user experience. Let's apply that patch and take a peek at some of the key elements to it up close. It's easier when we see a file list. There it is. I'm going to copy the wording here too. Loading status for containers. So you can see here, this is the container apps. JS DOS, Monaco, Ruffle, TinyMC, V86, Video Player, and the File Manager. Here's the container component itself where I've added those uh, pieces, the set loading and loading is what gets passed in. So that stuff gets passed into the generic hook and then the loading status is just saved here. So we pass the dispatch in to the hook and we pass it back uh, the loading status as well, but the, it's kept out here. Although that being said, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense in this case. There could be an argument for a hook returning something like this, but because I'm doing it this generic way, I'm managing the loading status externally to the hook. And then I show this loading component otherwise, and I keep the component as, vis as not visible, but I don't conditionally not load it because I want the component to load, but I want it to show hidden until the component tells me it's ready to show itself. And until that point, I'll show this loading screen. So let's try to demonstrate that. I think there's some easy ways, even though we're on local here. Let's see if refresh. Oh, probably because I'm doing my node canary updates. I'm going to, sorry, my next JS canary updates. We're going to need to uh, rerun the dev environment. I'm running it right now. Uh, what's the next commit after this? Yeah, we'll get to that one in a second. Okay, let me refresh. I'm reload. I reloaded the environment. We'll quickly take one more peek at the code. So like, like I said, that one, I just added the difference color. And then these, yeah, I pretty much just had to set the, where is it here? Set that it's loaded. Darned if I can't find it in this case. Ah, oh, here it is right here. Right, I made it an effect based on once the, the main library files are loaded. So I might change the position of this at some point. I don't know though. This is kind of like when the app's ready but then you still might not see anything until the next time, until the URL part's ready. So it's like, okay, the app is ready. Now give me a URL, you know? So there's gonna be that delay, but I, I haven't, that could be handled internally within each app until further notice, I guess. Um, okay, the app's loaded again, it's working. Let's see if we can see it here. I think, let's try with opening Linux. Uh, so that opened too fast. What if we try with DOS here? Oh yeah, I saw working on it for like a millisecond. One way we might be able to test this better if I open two of those apps at the same time. So I'll open Doom and then I'll open Linux. Uh, they, they still open too fast. Hmm. Well, humorously, it's a little too quick, but I, I did see a flicker of it. I, I mean, yeah, just a flicker because the libraries are already loaded. What if we do this? Let's switch the network connection here to be one megabit per second. And now if I open, let me re-clean the cache. It's going to be even slow to load at one megabit per second. Maybe I should have done a little faster than that. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of this is because of the dev environment, because honestly, the, the, the built environment is less than one megabit. So... It could load the entire thing faster, but 
Here we go. So let's load Doom and we'll see right away, I think. Yeah, working on it. I think you saw it there. It wasn't that long because the library for JS DOS is actually kind of small. But now it's loading the, the game, Doom game. Uh, as you, oh, you can't see, I guess. Let me try to make this bigger so you can see. Well, you can see Doom's at the bottom there, but it's hard to see the time thing or the size. It doesn't know how long it'll take. There we go, just finished. Cool. Yeah, that was a little deceptive because the URL, the file took longer. Let's try with Linux here. Working on it. There we go, it showed it again. But then, yeah, again, the V86 image loads, and then the, the actual Linux image, or Calibri in this case, takes a little longer because it's it's over one megabyte. Although, yeah, I guess that would take eight seconds then, nine seconds. In this case, it took 11 seconds, I guess it says, 11.54. Not bad though. Okay, let's not throttle our connection anymore. Let's go back to super speeds. Super Saiyan, super, I, I didn't watch Dragon Ball Z, so I don't know. I'm happy with this commit, let's commit it. Loading status for containers, done. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's move on to the next commit, the next commit. This one's a kind of a neat one, close process if folder is deleted. This one was funny because I I remember in the, at some point Windows used to be when, if you were in a folder and then you deleted it externally, it would all of a sudden jump you back to like the desktop or the, the previous folder or the something like that, somewhere else. But now I notice in Windows 10, it just closes if you delete a folder that existed. And that's actually not too hard to do with my app. So I decided to implement it doing that. So if we see now, I don't know what it does. I think it does something weird. I think it depends, you don't notice it unless something's in the app. So if I got some a folder here and then I delete this. You see now it's like a, there's an empty folder there but actually there's no folder here. So if I try to do this, I don't know what'll happen. Yeah, that's fun. Eventually I'll handle those promises. I gotta ha fix a bunch of my unhandled promises. So let's do that patch because that will be a nice little fix. All of these fixes at this point are almost like making it more o OS like. Like these are these are all the touches, the polish. Let's see what I did here. What did I do? We'll ignore the imports because it's like, okay, this is what was used, but who cares? I want to see how it was used. You know, I could list a million things here. Let's just see what, what, what happened. Uh, so I imported the close function from processes. I added a line for, I wouldn't say no reason. It probably should have been there from the start. So here's the main piece. I just added a check that if there was an error, that there wasn't a file anymore, the folder, sorry, on the read directory, that to just close it, close with transition. That's my command for doing a, a transition close. And the assumption is that this will be the process ID. Without knowing the process ID, I know that it was the file explorer process because we're, we're doing use folder. Uh, there's always the process delimiter and then the, it's based on directory. So that should close it in most cases. And that's all I did. Let's take a look. So now we make a new folder again and we put something in there. And then if I delete the folder, it just closes it on me. So that now is how Windows works. I'm not sure when they switched that. At some point, I don't think it was that way, but hey, why not? That's that's easy enough to do. I think either way would have been reasonably easy. I knew the point where it, it knows there's no folder and tries to make a decision. So it was kind of just like, well, what, what do we want to happen here? Okay, this stuff's done. Let's move on. So on the fourth, I didn't do too much. I got to drink some water here. Oh, actually, I'm proud of this one, too. This, for the longest time, I've been annoyed at this. Every app I was making, I was always in the styling, adding the title bar height. Uh, and actually, even more sloppily, is that I didn't always use title bar height. Sometimes I use task bar height, and it turns out they just happen to be the, the same number, so I didn't notice it. But here, I got rid of that completely, because it, it was always just annoying. The app should just be like, to them, they should just be in the little box of the window. They shouldn't know about that title bar. So I fixed that finally with some fancy CSS. So you see here me just removing it. Here's where I was using taskbar height 
that's not correct. It should have been the title bar. But at the same time, now it's just 100%. So you see these are all very much simplified. And then where did I change it here? I think for the file manager, here it mattered. Yeah. Here. Yeah, this was another one that was weird. I think that this coincidentally was working for the title bar. And then when it was shown on the desktop, it was working for the task bar. But the reality of it is there shouldn't have been padding here. And instead the height of the file manager, the desktop file manager, always should have accounted for the task bar. I don't know when that stopped happening. I mean, I guess that was the idea of this, but it was in the wrong place because this is in the general file manager. I only want it when when main is the parent file man of the file manager. That means it's the desktop. So it handles that differently. And then here's the magic where I added it. So on the window itself, I say after the after the header within every window, after a header object, do this to the next to whatever the next object is. And the reason I say whatever is because it's not always a div. Like in the case of some of the apps, it becomes a, it's a canvas or or some semantic thing or some uh, custom component in some cases, a web component, sorry. So yeah, all I had to do was that, was the header plus any anything after the header, the next element after the header basically, that's what I apply the height on. And I say important here versus in some cases I didn't need important, but in one case here, I think I did. Yeah, this case here, I did need it. So this just applies it in general because now everybody gets it. But yeah, this was a great one. Did I apply this yet? No. Let's let's uh, make this patch file. So this was just like a refactor, but it, I like it when it simplifies things, you know? The next time I make a, one of these apps, one of, the, one of the apps for my app, for my OS, I don't have to worry about that fake consideration of like, oh, the title bar height, because the app should just not worry about that or know about it. We'll take one more peek at the the meat and potato change. Yeah, it was just this one here, so that's it. Anyways, we just discussed that change. Visually, nothing changes, I hope. It didn't last time, so that's my measure of whether or not it's okay. We'll take a peek here. Let's refresh this and see. Yeah, the windows still look normal. The heights are still uh, correct on them. But yeah, now this box is 100% instead of accounting for this black bar here that it doesn't even need to know about. But because of CSS, it did at one point need to. So I've, mo I've moved that up. More linting rules. Yes, I love linting rules. I turn more of them on. Sort keys. Uh, no shadow being explicit. I think I was missing one there. Sort the props. Sort key, these are adding the rules for the sort key plugin up here. And, and I turned a unicorn rule off that's an annoying one. That Yeah, I think it was object from entries, prefer. This is a preference thing, but not in every case. And in the cases where I disagree with it one or more times, it's like, eh, I'm just going to disable this rule because I don't prefer that. You know, it's debatable when to do either. Um... TypeScript also has its own no shadow rules with some specifics that I've added um, to, to ignore neither. So as strict as possible, basically. And then I did a, a few simple auto fixes. These are all auto fixes that were based on the additional rules. Um, here it switched this to, it moved the typing up from here to up here. Okay, I'm okay with that. And then, yeah, I did a bunch of sorting here, which I'm happy with. So we'll, we're just going to fly through this piece. But that was it. Added the rules that involve sorting. And then there's just a ton of sorting going on here. So let's let's go take a look at the patch. And that's another thing I love about these ESLint rules. It's like, I don't mind it being alphabetical. I don't want to do it. It's it's too much work to always remember alphabetical. But the more you just keep adding lint rules and then auto fix rules. And then as you type, it's just like it morphs your code for you kind of. But it's based on on like expected results, so it's not like you're not uh, you're not part of the process, you know. Like, oh, the computer's programming for you. No, not really, not even close. It's just it's just helping the code be 
cleaner by and making less work for you. So it just does a bunch of renaming here. I mean, uh, sorting. And it's based on certain rules. So there's some logic here on the fact that key and source are first. Or no, sorry, source has been moved. Before, there didn't wasn't logic here. Key, it makes sense to have here. There's another sorting rule to say these base React elements go to the top. But then everything else has been alphabetized. That's the nice way to do it. So yeah, ref got moved to the top here because that's one of those base element props. Everything else here I'd already managed to alphabetize. But as you can see, I missed a bunch. Um, here's, yeah, I missed many alphabetization opportunities. And it's like, it's better that it's clean that way and now consistent. So I'm happy with that. More linting, oh. But somehow it failed linting rules. What linting rule failed? Let's run ESLint. Well, if you remember, we we do have packages newer than I had. Oh wait, did the package file change? I don't know, just added the sort keys one. It's saying here, it's likely that the plugin, try reinstalling. Oh, okay, I'll just try that. Oh, right, yes, yes, yes. I see. So I changed the package file, but I did not get this update. So let's just redo that command. We'll either get a newer version or we'll at least properly have the node module version installed. That will fix it. So now when we do the commit, ESLint won't fail because it has the proper dependencies to properly run its checks and it'll see that the code is correct and has already been auto fixed. And it'll let the commit go through in three, two, one committed. Hmm. Oh, there we go. I was off by a millisecond. Oh, what happened with this lock file? Oh, that didn't get staged. Darn it. Oh, uh, well, this is so minor. I'm willing to just leave it, but I'll slip this into whatever the next commit is. We'll leave this. Um, or I just care so little about this change, but yeah, I guess we should add it. Darn it. Let's just slip it into the next one. I don't want to waste a commit on that. Move rename styling until it needs separate views. What's that mean? Oh, this is just a slight move, I guess. Do I care about this? Let's not. So the issue is that it's currently in the views for the... All right, let's move it. We can do it easily enough. So the issue is with styled rename is that I i don't have the ability to do renames in a list view, only in the, the icon format. Otherwise, I, I mean, you could probably do an, a rename in the other format, but I don't know what it's gonna look like. So we're just gonna move this right into the file entry. Same place that the rename box is. So it kind of makes sense. The rename box is here and the style rename box is here. But at, at one point I was gonna have multiple stylings and at some point I might still, uh, I guess when I have column view for the file explorers and then we start doing list view, but that's going to look different than the list view that I currently have with the start menu. So there's multiple list views kind of. Um, yeah, that's a minor change just to move. So we're going to slip that yarn change in here. We're not going to even mention it. Move rename styling until it needs separate views, which it does not currently. Just the one view, just one one place you can rename. Let's. I think you probably could rename in the other one. Let's take a peek. It's probably gonna look weird. Let's try, rename. Yeah, that doesn't work. Rename makes the focus blur to the box, and then the start menu losing focus closes it, and then it closing it deletes the box, and you get this error. So let me make a note of that. Actually, that's probably bad. Um, don't allow renaming in start menu. Yeah, probably not, probably shouldn't be allowed. I'll get rid of that. That I that I do, I do not have. I know I haven't done that. I only just thought to test that now. Change how sidebar buttons render. Oh yeah, how'd I do that? What's the logic here? Why'd I, oh, that's much cleaner. I'm not sure why I decided to do this, but I do like that better. Oh, I think I know why it became the, it, the issue was this sorting issue. So if we remember the keys sorted and now top bottom became bottom top, but I was just going on the coincidental basis that the object order happened to be that way when I mapped it. 
it's not an ideal basis to to assume that the object itself will be sorted in any certain way. So that this was not ideal, and when it sorted the keys, it messed up the order of the buttons. This just seems better like this. So I, I've I've taken this piece out and made it a component called sidebar group that looks a lot simpler, anyways. And and then I just specifically pass in each button, so the top buttons, then the bottom buttons. If we look now, you'll see that they're flipped. The power button's up here. And this fixes that. And also it makes it, a, I think, a cleaner function anyways. Let's run our, our typical patches that we do. You know, the patches. Change how sidebar buttons render. Yeah, you saw it. It just took this piece plus this piece, I guess. Yeah, this piece and then mapping the buttons that instead of being a multiple, yeah, it was messy before. This makes way more sense. I think some tooling popped that, or no, no. The tooling sorted the keys, which showed me the flaw of using the, the keys of an object in a certain order to, to, as a basis for anything. Here I switched to the request animation frame for my peak view. So the peak is this when I hover over a taskbar entry and I get this little mini preview. Currently it's refreshing like every second or something. And I switch that to just ref whenever it's visible, it'll just refresh whenever it's got an animation frame. And let's apply that patch and then I'll discuss animation frames a little bit more. As if I know more than like a very rudimentary basis about them. But maybe they're rudimentary enough that they're, I don't need a base and a super deep understanding. I don't know. Who knows, man? So how does the, how does this refactor work? Right. So I switched it from a promise to be more asynchronous as well, which I kind of prefer in general. And I'm going to move to that slowly whenever it makes sense to in general, I do it, but some, sometimes in the code, especially for some of the FS stuff with the way the FS library works, the browser FS one, I've needed to use callbacks and I've relied on promises for that where it's been difficult to switch it to an async. Actually, it wouldn't have been too difficult, but I guess I could have done it with like some helper functions and stuff. I still might, you know, but it won't be hard. I don't think when I do refactor it just because the way the code is, if we see here, I didn't change too much. Um, but I changed enough. So let's try to figure it out. I've added this ref called animate so that I can know when to not animate basically before I was basing it on this timer and it was just after you'd hover over the mouse, it would wait like a, let's say half a second. And then every other half a second, it would continue to render, render, render. Now, instead, I do wait that initial half a second after hover, but then once it loads, I trigger this uh, request animation frame here. And what request animation frame does is it asks the browser, uh, can I do an, can I do some animation with, with a, do I have, do you have a moment for me to do some animation basically? And, and then you run that animation. And then the trick to it is at the end of the animation, you again do a request. So then the next time the browser has an opportunity, you've got that request kind of in queue where it says, okay, you want to do another animation. And then it just goes on and on. So that's what I've decided to do here, but I passed in this ref, this never moving reference. So in render frame, so that when I'm in render frame, I can make sure that we still want to animate. So I check the animate current is still true. And that's when I jump in here and I actually check it a second time here, because at this point we get to a callback. So if somehow it makes it in here and then as it's getting down here, it, this becomes false when it triggers here. It, if I didn't have another check, it could once again fail. Uh, and I don't want to cache the result. I want it to once again, check on animates dot current that specific reference. Otherwise, yeah, instead of thens, I've switched to the async await format. So I get the library. I convert the element to a canvas. And then I've made this next frame function here that will do that request animation. And then that's what I do here before I would just do the callback and I wouldn't request another go because I had that timer going that would just trigger another render frame. 
But now when the render frame is done, I say, hey, I'm ready for another frame. And I've kept the logic here because there's some glitchiness with certain apps where you don't get any data. So I've, I've kept this logic here where I make sure there's pixel data be before I update the image. And if there's not, I just once again say, well, give me another frame then. Okay. So visually, I don't know if there's much to demonstrate with it. If I, you see I hover, looks the same. Um, but in theory, it's more performant, I would say. At the same time, I've never benchmarked it. So anytime someone says it's faster just because they think what they've done is faster, I, I, I'm always doubting of that. It's like, well, did, did you measure it? Because you know about assumptions, right? And about how how they make you and me look, right? Okay, so we've done all of the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Let's move on to the sixth. Oh, I was busy on the sixth. And on the seventh day, and on the eighth day, and on the ninth day, when did I rest? And on the and then on the no day he rested. Okay, what are we at? We're at an hour. An hour clean. Let's let's keep going. I don't know how many we're 14 commits in. Let's do it. Fix second line padding for last entry. Oh. What was the issue here? Oh, I think if you remember, I removed this padding and now I realize I needed it. I needed both. So I didn't have the height before accounting for the taskbar. Oh, right. But I globally had it. Yeah. I never should have got rid of the padding. I think there was a confusion here where I thought, oh, the height was my accounting for the padding. But the, the reasoning for the padding is because the icon, if you make the OL just the height and then you have the taskbar underneath it. If the bottom piece is one of those icons that I allow to have two lines, then the second line could ha hangs in a little bit into the taskbar. So this padding makes it so that if the bottom icon, the, the bottom icon has all the space it needs, basically. To, it's breathing room for its legs. We'll just add this one straight without any patch. Yeah, it was just right here. I should have had some padding there. And we could probably demonstrate that easily enough here. Um, or can we? Let's copy all these icons. Okay. Yeah, so it actually has a lot of space here. I guess it just didn't have quite enough. We can't easily demonstrate it. If I had the dev tools in the bottom, I guess I could just do that. It'll make things look messy for the video. But if you see here the icon, so if I scroll too high, it's going to stop, flip at some point. There we go. So let's go down a little bit there. And now you see if I go there. So now the two lines fit with the perfect amount of spacing that I would expect. Whereas before it wasn't accounting for that second line and without that padding, it was, it was allowed to kind of sneak into the taskbar, which was not cool, man. Another one done. That was a minor one, nice and quick. Allow overflow out of viewport on desktop. Oh, right, this was a nice little fix. What did this fix again? Ah, yes. So another issue I had is here. If I'm making a rename and I started typing a bunch of stuff, you see how the icons start twitching. The reason for that, interestingly enough, had to do with having overflow being hidden. You would think that hidden is the solution, but actually, if it was hidden, it kept it would stay in that box, but for some reason with text boxes, it, this doesn't happen on every browser, but on Chrome at least, it would the scroll height would for a moment try to move up because the box itself is actually bigger. So the trick basically was anyways to allow the overflow to just f go down. So so the the, bo the box does keep going bigger, but it's beyond the viewport, so it's it's not really a, a concern when you're renaming. So let's see. So it's doing that twitchiness. Let's add this to literally the exact same place I just added the last thing, right above it. And then now let's see when we do that. So now if we rename it, there we go. No more twitching. And you'd think, oh, but Dustin, the text box is going into the, the bottom. You can't see it. Well, that, that can't be how Windows is. Yeah, that, actually that's how it is in Windows too. It just does, it just goes to the bottom, you know? I mean, what's the solution there? I don't know. Maybe they could make it like do this, but Eh. 
That's that was their UI compromise. It's my, it's I'm I'm happy to go with the same compromises they have. Another one done. I want to uh, start getting through these quick because these are mini ones here. Keep icon tooltip for mount for mounted extensions. Ah uh, yes, this was another weird one. When you open, so let's say we have a zip file here. Zip some stuff up here. We have a zip file. You see, I open the zip file as a folder. You see here how the icon's still a zip file, but if for some reason this folder gets refreshed, uh, it actually thinks, oh, you know, actually that was a folder because I see it's a folder now. And then the icon changes. I don't want that, obviously. This icon stays the same. This It knows what's up. Uh, and I don't know why that error occurred. I think that's a mounting error that I've resolved. We'll get to that in a minute. It broke the app though, nicely. Let's move the console back to where it was before, like that. Let's reset all this so it's cleaned up. And then yeah, what was that what was that fix again? All right. I'm going to make this into a patch and then we'll take a peek at it here. Okay, I'm in the code now. I'm in. Or is that is that what the, is that the term? I don't know. They're in. There's some like CSI style way to say that. I'm just gonna copy the text so I know the name. There we go. Keep icon tooltip for mounted extensions. So what did I change here? So I, I had I already had a list of mountable extensions. ISO, JS, DOS, WSZ, and ZIP. And here when the tooltip is created, the hover tooltip, that was one place where it was saying in the stats, if it's a directory, then don't do the tooltip. But if the stats is a directory and it's not a mountable extension, so it can be a directory, but if it's a mountable extension, then it's also a file and you can still do file information on it and give me a proper tooltip because we have tooltips here. And then in the file info piece, I also use that same object. And I, when we're getting the in icon information, if it's a directory and it's not mountable, then we treat it as not having an extension. Otherwise we treat it as have, we, we respect that compressed extension, mountable extension. So let's try that again. Make a few zip, make a zip file. We open it here. And now when I refresh here, there we go. It stays the icon you'd expect. And I'm going to refresh rather than close that. Cause I think that's broken if I try to close it. Okay. Another another nice fix. Fixes, I love them. Uh, as it is, it is true though. Like the more you fix, and the more you can just kind of fly around a website without being like, oh, it jittered or it did this weird thing. There's so much of that on every website. You know, Amazon, Facebook, all all the major websites. If you just try flying around them, weird stuff happens. And literally, as like you could fix that stuff. I'm sure most Facebook developers that are competent, if you just if they noticed a bug and they're like, okay, sit down for three days and fix this bug, probably they could, but that's not really how it works in most companies where you just, someone finds a bug and they're like, oh, I'm going to fix it. You know, I mean, how many people use messenger messenger has so many bugs and it's like, what if all the Facebook developers, every time they ran into a bug, they, they had to like sit down, roll their sleeves up and, and deal with it. That would be interesting. I don't know. There are probably less bugs in software. You know, it's the same same bugs have been forever in Facebook. Anyways, rant complete. Let's move on. I committed that one, right? Yeah, I did. No dragging for rename, right? So if I try to rename something here, I'm renaming. If I go to click and move this, it starts to do a drag. And I can, like, move it over here, and it's still renaming. That behavior is actually not so terrible. But at the same time, if I try to do... Let's try to do this. I rename here and then I drag it into this folder. Okay, so it's moved there, but watch this. If I move it back, it still thinks it was in rename mode. So that's weird. I could fix that weird behavior, but at the same time, I'd rather you just don't drag it. And it's easy enough. I just add on drag start. Don't do anything. And I add that to the rename box. That's an incredibly easy one. Where is it? Here it is here. And where does it go? Right after click. There. That's another really easy one. Let's see if that works. So now when I try to rename and I try to drag it, 
No, it doesn't let me. It lets, I like this, that it lets me do that with the text where it's letting me manipulate the text as if I'm dragging the text cursor. That's what I always wanted, so that's nicer. Oh, I found a way to move it though. Okay, I think I actually fixed that. Let's see if I fix that in the next commit. That was this one. Oh yeah, here we go. No dragging an entry, yeah. Some, somehow you can still drag the entry without blurring the text box off, which was the other part of the issue. Here we go. Let's just take a peek at that part. Draggable entry, wait, where is this? This is in the file manager. Here. Nope. I can't just say here if I'm not correct. That's just made up. Uh, this is the correct place though. Okay. Let's take a peek at what I changed here by looking at the diff because I much prefer to do that. Now this type is complaining, so I probably should fix that. Maybe I fix that in the next commit. Let's take a, we're going to add all these commits together. So in the file entry itself, I don't do I don't even apply the draggable entry effects to it if it's in a renaming mode. This was already something I could have done, but I wasn't. So now it's probably complaining about the fact that that's conditional. Let's see if I fix that. Hmm. So that one we just did. This one we just did. Was there another one? Only update, show logo. Well, we'll get to this one in a minute. It looks like I, I busted it. Dragging is optional now. Here we go. That's the third piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So in the styled file entry props here, we just say dragging is now optional for the entry. Because if it's renaming, we don't want it to be dragging. There we go. That fixed that bug as well. So now we change three files, but they're simple enough. On the text box, dragging is, is just completely disabled. On the entry, I wonder if the entry is disabled, does this matter? Let's comment this out for a second and see if that was even relevant. What kind of result do we get now? Rename. Oh no, yeah, it does weird stuff there. Yeah, I don't, whoa. What did that, oh right, that's another bug. I'll fix that one in a bit. That one involves pasting text. Okay, I've applied that thing again. So yeah, now I can't drag here, and now I can't drag the entry either when it's in rename mode. So that gets me away. Yeah, it's completely impossible now for me to drag the entry when the text box is visible, as far as I can see. I don't like using the word impossible, but I think unlikely. Let's add that commit. Let's say no dragging when renaming. That's the spirit of these three changes combined into one correct change. We'll close all this cruff here. There we go. That's the basics of that change. We just did three commits there in one. Let's not jump too far ahead though. These two we did. And then let's move to this one. No dragging. Yep. Yep. This one. Don't create folders from text. Ah, yes. I think I must have observed that error at the same time. So another fun issue here, let's say I'm in here and I take this text and I just drag text onto the desktop. Is tr It was treating that as like a folder and trying to make a folder. Uh, it actually made a folder, but that's, I don't, I just don't want it to do that at all. So let me, let me take that patch file here and we'll apply that one in the code. It's seven, seven. There we go. I might do something with that later, this paste text. I remember, I don't know what version of Windows it was, but at some point there was like a way to paste like a snippet or something they called it, where I pasted it on my desktop and it, it had like a weird icon, but I, I can't recreate that anymore. So I don't know what version of Windows that was when it did that. I don't think we need it for now. Could be handy though in the future. If someone wants to paste right onto my desktop and have it make a file, eh, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know if that's necessary. Here's all that was needed though to fix it. Um, when we do drag and drop events, if it's there's no buff, there's no file data, it goes to this condition here where it thinks it was paths. That was the issue before. It was it takes these paths and, and thinks they're draggable path events. That's how I, I've been doing it. But in this case here, I now I check to make sure it is a directory. So later on, I could use this check 
if I decide to do something with text. But for now, I'm just going to say, just make sure this. For each path, it has to be a legit directory. And that was the only necessary change to make that work. So now when you drag text, it does not make a folder named after that text. Next up, don't try and convert an invalid blob. That's good advice for anyone. Okay, so I don't know why this came up or how to recreate this. This might have been another linting thing. I'm not sure. It's probably correct because I think this blob can be null. So we'll just do this little bit of code here where we say if the blob is an instance of a blob, then we run the the code where we pass in the blob. I think the concern here is that this create object URL needs something. It can't be null. And I've decided to do the instance of check to be very specific that it is what we want it to be. Probably a little bit of overkill, but there's no rhyme and reason to it. I'd love an ESLint rule for that actually, for all the times where like, here I did the check this way, here I checked this piece, but not that piece. Here I checked these two pieces. If it could somehow see hey, do all of your conditions in this exact way, and here's an auto fix for it. That would be, oh, I don't, I don't know that one though, but because I know I don't always do every check, like it's not every time I run into a condition, it's like, okay, well, check for this and check for that and check for this. It's like, sometimes you forget something. That's where the abstractions help though. It's like, if you abstract out pass this to the, the this the validator and it'll just do those checks all the time and you always just pass it, you know? Having some kind of route for the data so you don't have to remember, always do this and that and that. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I might've read that in a book, but I'm just saying, that's just my sense on it. What's this one here? Allow loading player without URL. Yeah, currently if you open the video player, oh, what happened here? I think this might be that canary issue I was talking about, where just all of a sudden the dev environment's like, no, I'm, I'm done working. I'm gonna make a patch for this, because this is a good little chunk of code. So yeah, the video player, I want it to be able to load without, watch here, let's clean this, clear the cache, make this a little bigger. When we open the video player right now, it's just a black window, because the controls are controlled by video.js. And I do, I've done the custom styling on the controls. Let's patch this up. I've tried to make it look like v VLC video LAN for, for those people that know that. A little logic I added here. I got rid of the URL check. I've made the load player function contain a few more things, things that we don't need necessarily if we're not loading. Source is now optional. So once there's a player, it'll load the player first play logic. But if there's no source URL, it's not gonna do player.source piece. Same thing here, it's not gonna update the title or clean buffers if there was no URL. And if there's no URL here, it's not gonna try to parse a URL or to load a YouTube URL. Um, basic stuff, but yeah, it didn't have that before. So now it'll load the player no matter what, but if there's no URL, it won't go any further. So now when we open video player, there we go. So now we see the, the controls that we all know and love. The, my attempt to get the video land controls reasonably well. Oh, wow. So you can't move this bar when there's nothing to play. That's good. No, nice. Is that a bug? I don't know. Not something I care about. Anyways, simple fix. I'd like to, let, like VLC, you can do that. So I'd like to be able to do that with this one. Next up, I added some styling, some cool styling. So show player logo on center when no video is playing. This is an easy enough fix I can just copy. I don't do too much video styling. Here it is. Oh. Darn it, sorry, let me jump back to the code. So in the styled video player, I just added those three lines. Background image is the is the icon, the big icon. 
position. I tweaked the position a little bit to be the way I liked it and only show once. So now when we open the video player, it looks uh, a little bit more like the video of BLC that we, we all recognize. Except I, I'm doing a slightly different bar, my version of it, you know? They have like a, a double bar and they have no bar. And I, I've put somewhere in between. Commit that. Next up, only update, right, this was another bug fix where it was updating more folders than it needed to because the logic here was a little unnecessary. Here it was like, if it's a parent of itself or if it starts with, this starts with was killer. So if you updated something that had a lot of subfolders, it was updating all the subfolders. This is simplified the logic a lot. But as you can see from the commit message where I've done for now dot 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 is I, I don't quite remember why the logic used to be this complex. So it's possible I've reintroduced a bug. That's a, again where tests are great. But reverting this fixed another bug. So I'm saying now I value the fixing of that bug more than whatever other bug crops back up basically. So that's, that's, that's my willing to accept it because I guess the argument is that, well, yeah, like I don't have a test for the failed case. I'm just trying to think how tests would have helped that. I probably, it would have been caught earlier, I guess. That's the argument for it. Only update the relevant watchers. Yeah. So I just removed some, some rules. Don't check directory name anymore. Just just if it's the base one. That seemed good enough. Maybe at one point it wasn't, and now with the way that I do the, the loading, it just works better. I've definitely evolved the loading of the the folders over the months. It feels like it's been years some days. It doesn't feel like it's been a short amount of time. It's not one of those things. So we've done this already. Dragging is optional, so we'll skip that one. Wrap for spaces. What is this one? This is for the renaming? Yeah. So for the style renaming, right. I think it wasn't quite wrapping exactly the way I wanted. I don't even remember exactly how to demonstrate that. But let's just say that this is closer to how I wanted it. And let's just leave it at that. White space is break on spaces. Ah, right. Let me show you the issue. I do remember it now. Oh, man, the auto formatting is really bad with comments for styled components. So the issue is if I make a folder, if I do spaces, it's not calculating that new line. Oh, again, I'm not demoing it. Darn it. So here we go. So see there I'm typing and it's doing two lines, but if instead I do a bunch of spaces, it never treats those spaces as a second line. That's where that wrap styling comes in. Now when I do spaces, it'll treat it as lines. There we go. I don't know why you'd want to do that. I don't recommend it. So wrap with spaces green rename. Wrap for spaces green renames. It's a little more descriptive. 1.1% more descriptive. Oh, where are we in this journey? Here we are here. Timeout controls in full screen, right? So this was kind of a neat one. So when the video player opens, before I had it, it would always show the controls, but in full screen, I don't want it to. So what instead I've done is I switched the inactivity timer to say, okay, stop showing after one second. But then what I've done here is I've said, I basically said, ignore what this does. But what that does is sets the opacity to zero. I basically have a rule that says, well, I want the opacity to always be one. That That's more important to me. But then when I detect that there's a, a full screen class applied and we're in the inactive mode, which occurs after one second, that's when this class gets applied, then, okay, set the opacity to zero. So I basically control the opacity myself a little bit. So that's more like VLC now, because in the Videoland player, 
you always see the controls in non full screen and then in full screen they they go away after once roughly one second of inactivity pretty quick anyways I'm, I'm always surprised as i try to recreate things and start observing certain things it's like oh yeah that menu actually does disappear pretty quick you know but it's not the kind of little stuff you typically notice when you're just using an app or using your computer. Can I demonstrate this? No, let's just commit it. Just trust me on that one. In the future, you'll be able to test it all out when you play with the video player. I could demonstrate it, but it's pretty boring. It's just, it's the lack of something occurring. So it's not really worth showing. It's the lack of something not occurring. I don't know. It, it's underwhelming though. I'm not gonna waste time demoing that one. Set max length for file renames. Yeah, this is pretty minor. This is just copying Windows for the fun of it. I noticed that with Windows, the maximum length for renaming a file was 223 characters. I can't remember if I figured out why that was. I don't think I thought of a good reason why it was that way. But that seems to be the limit. I, I couldn't link it to anything cool like some fundamental thing like like we're in physics and I'm trying to do like natural numbers or something not natural numbers uh constants the universal constants this is a universal constant of windows that uh you can only rename something to the length of 223 characters so I've decided to replicate it because 223 characters is probably enough anyways Let's commit that one. I just used the max length field because I'm using a text box and the HTML5 text box component already has the ability to do set max length. So that's not a React thing or nothing. What's next? Oh, here's where I finally do that overlapping blur effect that I've been telling you about. So what did I do? A uh, slight tweak to the numbers, went from 10 to 12, that's minor. So I took it off of the whole start menu and instead, if you see before, before I was applying the styling, if here's the start menu, I was applying the blur effect directly to this, and then I wanted another blur effect here. But what I need to do is have no blur effect here, and instead have a blur effect here and here with side-by-side -side children. This can't, there can't be a parent and then another blur effect in its child, but there can be two side-by-side -side ones. And then what I do is have this element, all it basically is, is a background that just fills up all the space and, and be, is a blur. Now, I think I have to fix a few things with this. So let's apply a pat, the patch for this one and, and then apply a few other little tweaks that I think are necessary along the way. Hopefully they're in the, the follow-up commits. This commit is named, oh, not that. Surprise, I got a five terabyte hard drive. I just gave away that secret. So let's see the changes here. Yeah, that one was just adding that component in. This is tweaking the blur size. Uh, this was removing it from here. And then here's that new component. It's pretty simple. It's just a span with the backdrop filter where the blur is here now, 100% height, 100% width, and it's position absolute. And I adjusted the Z index here so it would be behind the other stuff, but it still show the blur effect. And the and the, there's a tweak I need to do after I think for position. So let's also follow up with that tweak here. Let's see when did I do that? Don't allow. Adjust padding for items. More basic mounting. Huh? When did I fix this? Maybe it was this. Yes. Is this the title bar? No, this isn't it. Huh. Well, I don't know when I follow up with the fix to that. Let's just commit it as is then. Menu tweaks. Could it be this? Because it is a menu thing. Oh, yeah, it is this. Here we go. The style start menu background. So we'll apply these menu tweaks momentarily, but let's just fix this piece because that was a part of this commit we want to do here, this overlapping backdrop filter. So for a position, the issue I was having is when it would animate up, it there was a little space at the top because it wasn't necessarily locked to the top as the item was resizing. What we're going to do to fix that is we're going to use inset. Inset is basically like 
top zero, bottom zero, left zero, right zero. So it's shorthand for that. That should allow us to have these multiple blurs. So let's take a look. So now when we open the start menu, this is still blurred. And if I hover over here, now that's blurred as well. Nice. That's the way I always wanted it. Overlapping backdrop filters on start menu. Not the most clear commit as to what I actually achieved there, but that's okay. So we'll leave this open because I need those. Wait a minute. No, this was that entire commit. This we can close. This part I'll leave open because that was only part of the inset that I... I think eventually I, I redo this with inset, but let's just leave that as is for now. Let's move on to the next commit. Fix the mounting issues. What were the mounting issues? Oh yes, when I opened zip files and tried to close them, it was having some complaints. Right, I think I ended up refactoring this as well, but let's just apply what we have here. So the idea was that it wasn't good enough. Yeah, this is this this commit I'm not proud of. <laughs> kind of silly that we're doing this one here, but it, it does fix some mounting issues. I think in the long run though, it was it was an overkill commit. Let's let's look at the why of that. Let's try to understand it. Because you know what? I don't I don't know if we'll be able to. So the issue with mounting was on close, it was not proper. It was already saying that it had been dismounted. So my fix for that, I got rid of the is mountable check and we just did one simple check here. But I've also added this mount points logic. The problem with this mount point logic is that this is actually the file manager for one folder. So there's only ever gonna be the mount point of the folder itself. So is it mounted or not? So this should have been a Boolean from the start. We're gonna go with it as is, cause this works and we're gonna see the next commit because it gets simplified and I think it's for the best probably. But you see where I was going with this. Instead of checking the length of files, I had made this note as to something being mounted instead. So just say, yeah, it's mounted. And then when I disconnect or when I close the effect here, when it destroys, I would unmount it only in that time. That was the issue was that it was getting dismounted too often when it was triggering, but I don't even think this completely fixed it the way that I wanted. It made it more complex. But let's just say we fixed it because we did fix it. And then let's move on to a refactor to improve that fix. Uh, shortly. I don't think it's the next thing. Oh yeah, here, let's, let's, just, let's just skip ahead to that one and then we'll come back to this one. So more basic mounting logic. So let's just, let's just commit this patch and then we can see almost like a, how, how would we refactor this? Follow up. Oh, I wish my desktop automatically refreshed when I added files to it. That would make it easier. Let's see what the tweak was. So instead of using those mount points, what I've switched back, what I've switched to is just like I said, a Boolean that says, was it mounted or not? Was it, was it the kind of file manager that needed to mount something or not? And then when it loads, so it checks if it's a mountable extension and it hasn't been mounted. And that's when it mounts it and it just sets true. That's all it has to do. And then this becomes much simpler. Is it mounted and it's closing? Unmount it. As you see before, this was a mess. I was removing amount points as if there was ever more than one. So that was where it needed a bit of a, a rethink. I'm going to call that two. I'm going to call those two commits as one here. Fix mounting logic plus more basic mounting logic, even though it was two commits. I'm gonna push these 29 commits in case the power junks in my my house and for some random reason. I don't know why it would, but it's just my fear of control S, control S. Okay, so let's move back to dynamic rename here. This was that fix I wanted to do so that if, if you see here, when we got a file here, let's say it's just a letter X. The box is the full width. I don't want that. And luckily I fixed it. Now you'd think that sounds, that sounds like something easy. Why not just do hundred percent width there done? Well, not really. It'd be nice if it was that easy, but what I've started to notice with just browser development or, or maybe just this is development in general is that 
just because there's no way to do it on Stack Overflow or it's not in the docs or whatever, there's usually some hacky way to make it work. Now, that's not to say that this code that I've done here is hacky. I, uh, it very well might be, but we'll see. So instead of a width, I've set a max and a min. So the minimum width is 30. The max is whatever I've got in the theme. Now, the reason I have that in the theme, the max, is because I'm also using it for some math within the JavaScript. But the minimum I don't care about, so I'll just put that right there. Now, I take from the theme the formatting and the size. So before, all I was doing was the height. Whenever you typed, it would update the height. Now what we're doing, this is pretty comp complicated. I mean, I don't, not necessarily complicated, but basically what I'm doing is I needed to know the font, the max size and the font, because I'm actually measuring, every time you type a letter, I would measure the width of the letter, add the padding and resize as necessary. How am I doing the measurement? Same way that I'm doing it for the truncate logic. Uh, this function I made called get text wrap data that actually creates a, a canvas and draws the text and measures it based on the exact font and font size that you give it. So that's the only way that I could really find to find grain control and know the exact width of the text. And then I took the width and I do this plus 22. Now you might say, why 22? Well, the two is for the, there's always this one pixel container border basically. What, because I have it with this uh, st border box style that I have. It, I could make it not that way, but I'm perfectly fine for that inherit. Uh, although actually at the same time, I could probably just get rid of those little twos. We wouldn't need one here then either. Let's not worry about that. This two is the same as this two. The 20 is, is a padding of 10 on either side. Now the reason for the pen, 10 padding on either side is, is I need a little bit of padding so that we can be sure that the scroll bar is not gonna try to change. Because if the scroll bar changes, it messes with our scroll height thing. Because before we, we always had height. Now we have height and we have width. I've also changed the way we set it. Before I was doing set attribute style, but that would only have the styling be just whatever you set here. Instead, I just directly set the styling on the elements. And I, I've, I've not done it text area dot style because you know, I could, but it complains. The reason why it complains is because the text area is also a pro uh, an argument that got passed in. So it says, oh, hey, you're mutating the argument, you know? In this case, I want to, but the little way around that is doing this. I'm not sure I'm happy with that. Yeah, like if I paste it here, we'll see what it complains about. Does it complain or is it not complaining no more? Hmm. I'm surprised it hasn't complained. Let's try this. Well, if ESLint is going to be okay with that, that's better. Before, it, it really did not like me doing this. I don't know why. It seems okay with that. That's cool if it is. Let's take a look at what it, it looks like now. So now when I go rename, so you see it's much smaller. And if I say, hello, my name is... Nice, so now it's basically working. So once it hits that max width, then it starts going line by line. And if you make it smaller, it'll make the box smaller until it gets to that minimum width. And, and that minimum width is is also the 30 pixels, that's from Windows. That's not some number I just made up. So that's once again to make it look more like Windows as we do. Great, well, I'm happy with that. And I've also gotten rid of that one line that turned out to be useless. I don't know why I thought, maybe because I added this instance of check, it stopped complaining here, but it was complaining before when I was setting this. I guess I just didn't know exactly what the element was like. Don't set style on an event target, it might've been the issue. But in reality, it's the event target is always a text area, but you have to, if you don't do the types like this, it complains one way or the other. So you end up doing like TypeScript massaging sometimes, but at the same time you are making things more explicit. So it's like, it's just, it's just like, well, you should have been able to infer this. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe the problem has cropped up. Yeah, you see TypeScript doesn't like it. Assignment to property of function parameter. Well, why didn't you show me this a moment ago, ESLint? So ESLint's acting a little silly because it didn't tell me that. And it let me make a fool of myself. 
this is okay. That's what frustrates me here. So maybe here's here's the one time where where we'll do an ESLint ignore. ESLint disable is it? And then ESLint enable. I think that's the syntax for that. Because honestly, yeah, this is, sometimes I would be totally okay with that error, but I'm actually agreeing. I probably shouldn't be typically reassigning parameters from an argument, but in the case where it's an element, I wonder if there's an exception for that in the ESLint rules. Okay, so it's, it's still complaining. I obviously haven't done the disable properly, but at the same time, let's see if there's an exception that can cover us in this case. What options do we got here? Ignore property modification for, can I specify a type of element? Hmm. No, I don't want to specify just like some property. So how does ESLint disable work again? Because I'm not using it correctly, obviously. Uh, here we go. How do you disable? Oh, I actually did use it pretty darn close to correct. Maybe it just doesn't, it, the format has to be like this, probably. Let's see if that's a little more amicable to committing. I almost never have ESLint ignores. I mean, this isn't even an ignore. This is like, I disagree with it, but in general, I don't. Hopefully it commits this time. Okay, cool. So we're gonna do that as is. In the long run, I guess it added one line instead of two, but it kept the, the, the spirit of the code more the way I wanted it, so. What was this? This was Dyna, yeah, we just committed that. Let's add it. Oh, I already added it here too, right? I just had trouble committing the darn thing. Let's move on to the next commit. We did more basic, we did this, so we're here now. Don't allow extracting ISOs, yes. So that was a trick where the mountable extensions includes ISOs, and I do have the ability to mount them because BrowserFS has a thing called ISOFS, and it has another thing called ZIPFS. The ZIPFS works for all the other mountable extensions, but it, I don't have something to open ISOs, basically, so I just need to change that one line, which we'll just we'll just hunt for it and just change it ourselves. It's only in this one place. Yeah, so it's the right-click menu here for the extract here function. And we'll say, it's if it's mountable, but it's not an ISO, then we can extract it because we have zip support for extracting and we have ISO and zip support for mounting. But that's, that's the basic difference. Don't allow extracting ISOs. Yep, yep, yep. This is just a refactor episode. I mean, I guess these are bug fixes in some ways. Menu tweaks, oh yeah, what kind? This we already did. So this was me tweaking the start menu still. I feel like I've got, I got rid of the padding and then brought it back. Improve start menu animations here. Oh no. Improve, ah, there it was. So I think these two work together, the menu tweaks and the improved start menu. Ah, here's where I did that inset, if you remember I had inset. So that solves this one and this one. But then, yeah, here I'd gotten rid of padding top, but here clearly I brought it back. So we're gonna ignore that change as well. We'll take this start menu change. Let's take that to the start. So instead of 400 milliseconds, it's 450, pretty minor. Now. That to, to tell you guys a bit of the details, how I found out that instead of 400 milliseconds, 450 looked better is via my streaming software. I literally recorded my screen, opening my start menu in Windows and then opening it on my my OS. And, and then I went frame by frame and counted how many frames they were to find out that mine was 12 frames, but the start menu in Windows was 13 frames. So I added this 50 milliseconds to get that one extra frame just to try to match the animation a little bit better. So that's that's the kind of distance I'm going here, just so you can uh, know that. Not that it should give me any respect. I don't deserve any any of that. Or, or do I? I don't know. 
I don't think people ever feel like they should deserve respect. Or, or, or no, maybe they do. I don't know. I, I don't crave it, but I was just trying to make a point. So let's combine these commits and call it the, we'll, we'll keep that name of the improved start menu animations. So what have we changed here? So instead of that ease, custom ease I had before that I didn't really understand completely what this bit, I mean, I know it's a Bezier curve that they call it. Uh, and this negative number actually did give me an effect that I wanted, but darned if I can remember the logic of this versus this is just a, an effect, C circle out. looks pretty close to the same thing. And then here, what I've done is I've kept the height a little bit bigger. Instead of having it start at nothing and go all the way, I have it start at 75%, and I do the same for the padding. So they both start at 75%, so like the menu is coming up, and then the padding separate from that. So it's almost like, oh, like they come up together slowly. I'll show you what it looks like. I'm still tweaking it, it's still not perfect, but here, I open the start menu, and that's basically how it looks. So you see how the, the the list items kind of come out a little bit delayed. So slowly it's it's looking I mean, you gotta take my word for it, I guess, but it's it's looking closer, I think, to, to the start menu. I still feel like before I release it in the months to come, I'm gonna have days where I'm gonna just like today I'm focusing on the file entry and I'm gonna just microscopically look at it and then do that for each little piece and try to get them just to make sure I've got every pixel where it's supposed to be. But at the same time, I'm, I'm always doing that. So hopefully, hopefully we're already pretty close. I think we are. Okay. That was those two commits combined. Where did that, that was here. Let's not skip over this one. So improved arrows for scroll bars. This is another nice one. That was actually a lot of work. So I made images for each piece of the scroll bar. I actually, it's actually complicated the way I did it. Well, let's just download it here so we can look at the images. So the way it was before was silly. I had these four SVG paths for up, down, left, and right. And then I had this like function that would make an arrow and, and the colors, I couldn't have the colors I wanted before. And the, it made the code more complex. Here I, I've simplified a lot of that. Let's take a peek at it. I'm really quite a bit more proud with how dynamic I've made it and how more accurate. Let's look at how it is now first before we apply it. So it's gonna be a minor difference, but if you see the scroll bars here, the up and down arrows, they're kind of like this dit, dit arrow that's pretty close to the Windows one, but you know what? It's not exact and that cannot stand. So. Not to say that I have it exact yet, but I have it a lot better. So if you look at the arrow I have here, that's the arrow down, the left, the right. It's kind of just like a chunkier, more like pointy arrow. But the way that I did it, I basically just zoomed into the scroll bar in Windows to the max I could. And then literally pixel by pixel recreated it in an icon app. And then I took that icon and converted it to a PNG, ran the PNG through file optimizer. Long story short, these four icons together is like a hundred bytes. It's just nothing. It's I think it's smaller than the SVGs were. And the SVG logic was messy. I got rid of all of that. I was able to make this quite a bit simpler before it had all these where it was just like color black. Now what I do is I just pass the, the images in once. I was able to, to generalize these rules, put them together. I show the image as pixelated because that gives me those pixels that I want the way that I made it. Cause I made it as a pixel image pixel with pixel graphics. Um, and then the last cool little piece I did here was this background blend mode of color burn. And what that does is when you click down on it before I, I had it, I had the arrow actually changing to like black. Uh, but in, in windows, it actually changes to like almost black. And I basically got that effect with this color burn where it actually just takes the picture and like almost inverts the colors of the picture. So let's take a look at how the arrows look now. I'll refresh this, open it again. So there you go. So if you see, there's almost no difference, it's, but it, it actually looks very close now to the Windows one. And you see when I click down how the, the little thing turns black, that's the same brown image or gray image, but with this blend, uh, this color burn effect. And and yeah, that's, that's as close as I'm gonna get it for now. Like, I don't feel like I need to follow up with that. 
I feel like that's as close as, I mean, I'm going to do the double checking, like I said, when I go closer to release, but that's almost pixel perfect, that one. It's funny, I used to always tell employers and stuff like, oh, I don't want to be a pixel pusher and be very specific with pixels, but at the same time, I actually enjoy it. So I, I don't know. I guess I just don't want to be known for that and, and be like where people are, are cracking the whip like, you didn't get it this pixel right. Uh, if if people if people if the UX people treated their Figma like like it was the Holy Grail, then maybe I would be a little bit better with that. And and actually, for the most part, they do. Okay, where were we? I already did this one, the Start Menu one. So now we're at the Adjust Padding for Items. Okay, right. I decided to move the padding a little bit. So if you remember, I had seventy five percent for both transitions for the Start Menu. I think I've just slightly change that. I want the padding part to be 50%. And that was actually me going again, frame by frame and noticing that the, the list items were loading a little too high up, just slightly. And why I've used percentages here, uh, I just felt that it, it fit well and it makes sure that I don't go over the, the containers themselves. Okay. Adjusted padding for items. We're almost at two hours now, an hour 51. That was a super minor commit. Almost worth apologizing for it was so minor. But anyways, it's all about tweaks. That was it for that day, for the 7th. We don't have too many days left here. The 8th. So here's the, I do the pan zoom thing. Uh, the title bar stuff we're probably not going to get to, as I was saying, the address bar, I mean, sorry. Let's do the pan zoom now. Yeah, we did this, right? That was just that one line, wasn't it? Okay, yeah. So now the pan zoom library. And so for pan zoom, credit where credit's due. Kimmy, Kimmy will. So I'm using this pan zoom library here. 1.6 thousand upvotes. The library for panning and zooming elements using CSS transforms. W works for me. GPU accelerated. Uh, yeah, it's it works nice. You know, we're using it at my my work too. Uh, so I decided to figure out how to use the darn thing here. Instead of trying to roll my own, I tried to roll my own for a while, but it's there's actually a lot to getting all the little details right for, for panning and zooming. And honestly, this one doesn't do everything I like. It has one little issue with pan zooming out. Oh no. It's Oh right, <laughs> that's funny. So the patch file wants to update our package file. Let's edit the patch file and just not do that package.json change. So what's the change? It adds the pan zoom library. Okay, we'll just do that ourselves. Same with the lock file. Get those two changes out of there. Oh, they're right at the bottom too. That's convenient because it's not easy to necessarily edit these files. There we go. So we've manually modified our diff file, reapply it. And then I will go in and run that command to add that library. Git, no, not git, yarn add pan zoom. And we will just add it straight in there. I don't know if it's going to be a newer version than the one before. Yeah, 441. No, that's what I had anyways, so that's okay. Let's look at the change. Basically, I just gutted my changes and, and put theirs in. Actually, let's before we look at the change, let's make sure I didn't do follow-up changes, these nefarious ones I keep doing. Simpler pan zoom, more correct. No, that's nothing. This, yes. Let's just apply simpler pan zoom now. Let's not let's not even look at whatever the heck I did if I've already done a simpler one. So we'll go back to the code and we're gonna just apply that that other patch right over top of this first patch we did. So we can look at the amalgamation of them. Probably not the right word. Luckily it applied it with no errors, no problems. That's always nice. So right, another thing I did is I switched, stopped using the, the name drag zoom and I switched it to be called pan zoom. Let's just double check if there's not yet a third thing. I don't think so. Nothing else big. So let's, uh, let's start looking at the changes now. So in the main app itself, I've stopped using the use drag zoom hook and now I'm using the use pan zoom one and also get the config from there. From the config, I take the maxes and min scales to, to use here in comparisons. 
Here's my new hook. So it exports a lot of the same things, slightly different functions, zoom in, zoom out, zoom to point, get scale and reset. These are the same ones that PanZoom is using. I pass in an image and a container. And for scale, I, every time the, the, the app refreshes, I just rerun get scale so that I have scale to work with. It could be in here, I suppose. Maybe that makes more sense. Do we need get scale otherwise? Yeah, we don't. Let's just do that. Elemental P Q R S. So this is in the right place. Let's export scale. And what we're going to do is we're just going to run it inside the hook. That to me makes more sense. Here, instead of get scale, we'll just say scale equals. Well, maybe we'll put it up here like it was like we did with the other one. Yeah, that's fine. Makes more sense to do it in here and just export it out. And we'll have to clarify that here that we're no longer. All right, here's the cool way I did the types. We'll get to those in a second. Let me just remove get scale and say that this also can be a scale that was a number, I guess. Yeah. Okay, let's look at these files here. So I guess I'm it's a little harder to see the differences now, darn it, because I totally renamed the file. Let's look at the differences here when I first did them then. Actually, maybe let's just look at the implementation I've done rather than see what I cut out. What I cut out wasn't good, honestly. Let's just look at how I've implemented it now. It's much more simple and it's based on using the PanZoom library. So I've made a hook called use PanZoom, similar to the one we had before with drag, but we get the functions here from PanZoom, like get scale, reset, all of these come, come out of the box from the library. So I didn't have to make any of these this time. We still have the resize observer so that if the size changes, we set the scale back to normal those we had before, but now it just passes in a very simple, just the reset command straight up. So reset observer that just says straight up reset. Nice and simple. Here we have another hook that if the, all the components are ready and we've got the, the function we need, we also add a few listeners. I wonder if this gets triggered more than once. It only needs to trigger the one time. I guess it's no harm, no foul. Let's do a console log here because I, I'm starting, I'm feeling like that gets triggered more than I want. But then uh, ignoring that part, on the image element, we apply the pan, we, um, pan zoom has a special event that gets triggered called pan zoom change. So every time there's a zoom change, I now have the ability to run this function that we'll take a peek at. And then in the container, when there's a wheel event, we just pass in the zoom with wheel. And for some weird reason, I had to increase the step value. Uh, the point one works perfectly fine on the config, but for the mouse wheel, I had to triple it to get the same zoom level. So I'm not hundred percent sure why that is, but it's uh, not a big deal. And then here's the initial load where we first run the pan zoom library and we attach it to the image with the config file and the config file is pretty much just like how the other one was. Uh, we had to clear the cursor setting here because the pan zoom tries to do a move cursor. I don't, I don't need that. That's not how windows does it. The min and max scales are just like before, seven and one. Um, we only do panning when it's zoomed in. That's how I prefer it. And the step level is the same as before. So one cool thing here for the typing is I was able to get the pan zoom object from the library and do a TypeScript pick, where I say from this type, I wanna pick just these four things. So these four things are part of my pan zoom object along with that scale that I'm exporting. And that's the basics of it. So let's look at the zoom update function. That's one other piece. So resume update, you get the pan zoom event. I take the initial event and from there, assuming that the scale, uh, oh, this is confusing. This is some shadowing going on here. Let's not have this scale variable here and we'll just put it straight in the return value here. Simple enough. I'm okay with that. Now scale is just up here 
internal to the zoom update function. So yeah, so the if a scale comes back, it's pretty much certain to actually. Why do I have this? I guess if the pan zoom event is empty, then they would be zeros. I don't feel like that's going to occur, but that's fine. Let's just leave this check here, ignore it for now. We, we get the config settings we need. Yeah, I, this is totally an unnecessary destruct, but it makes the, the logic here a little cleaner. That's why I did it. So instead of like panzoom config.scale is greater than panzoom config. You know, just very clear here. The minimum scale is based on if the scale is less than the minimum scale plus the next step. So in other words, if if you if zooming out if you're like if you're less than one step away from being at the minimum amount of zoom, I'm just going to call that minimum and I'm going to zoom you out. So in that case, if we're at the minimum and there's any positioning already occurring, either any panning going on, then we're going to reset. Now, I've added a little timeout here. Now, the reason I did that is if you try to zoom out just instantly while you're in the middle of doing mouse wheel, the mouse wheel events, which are triggering all these event prevent defaults, make they mess up the animation. So I found what was best is, is let the user zoom out a bit and then kind of like right after they stop, then it'll move and reset. That looked better and that also allowed the animation to work properly. And then just the typical updating the title, we had that before. So let's try it out. We got we got all the stuff coming in here. Uh, this logic here didn't change too much before. It was is Mac Zoom. Now it's just I'm doing a lot the the checking here because I don't reuse it. In theory, I reuse it here, I guess. But yeah, I didn't. I yeah, it didn't need to be that way before. This is this is a better way to do it. Scale equals max scale. Nothing really changed here. Instead of zoom out, now I have a zoom out function. This toggling, instead of a toggle function, I've just put the logic here for it, that if the scale's already at minimum, we zoom to where the person clicked at double the minimum scale animated. Otherwise, we unzoom them. So let's let's put all this together and see what it all looks like. Let's see, uh, Let me just find some photos. Any photo will do. Here's one. So we'll open this up. So here's our photo app. So now you see when we zoom in, it's working, it's updating there. And if we zoom out, there you see that little reset that occurred. And, and you see when it zooms in now, now it zooms into where I have my mouse up here. So you see here, if we reset back and then I zoom my mouse over here, it'll zoom in over there. That, I, that feature I didn't have before. And then we have our panning still, and we have our double click will reset. And then if it's already reset and we double click, it'll do the zoom in. And now it zooms into the point where I double clicked. So if I double click there, it'll zoom into that point. It's not the best zoom in in the world, but it, it does its best. We still got our buttons here. So basically we have all the functionality we had before, but uh, with this new, more robust library, I feel that's better maintained than my messy pan zoom logic that didn't follow, didn't care about the pointer positions. That's all been cleaned up. This is the, the pan zoom library. Use pan zoom library. Pan zoom, pan zoom. And now it's called use pan zoom instead of drag zoom. Because I called it drag when I invented it, but it turns out people call it panning. Okay, let's commit it. We've discussed that one enough. Here's the, that was those two commits right there. We went through both of those. So let's move on to this one more. This is, I think, really simple. Yeah, this I just had the type wrong. Uh, this doesn't make a difference at the moment, but all my types should be right. At some point, I'm going to fix this actually, because the way I'm doing typing sometimes grosses me out. Like this new path here, it should be inferred from the original function that, that I want. But because I'm like, I'm like, oh, I need that function over here. I've actually just made the function type again. I need to be a bit more reusable with my, my function types. And I'm not doing that to the, to the best degree. But this was incorrect. This I changed from void to being a promise string a long time ago. Not that long ago, but it was time to update the type. Very simple commit. Not going to discuss it anymore, but I'm going to have a drink of water. Ah, delicious water. Okay, we're making good progress here. I actually don't think we have too many more because we're going to skip some in a minute. 
I think a good chunk of these ones we I'm working on file explorer having the address bar with the back button, the forward button, the up button, the refresh button. I'm getting there. But I don't think I'm ready to show anyone yet on that one because it's not done. It's not done enough where I can I can be like, here's the code, here's the code in action. And here it'd be like, here's some code, here's my attempt to make it move, but this button doesn't work, you know, that kind of thing. So we're, I don't want to skip too far ahead. What's this one here? Focus on clicks also. What's this? Oh, okay. Here's another cool fix that actually ended up being really simple. So if you see here, long story short, uh, so the window is not focused. I right click a file entry and then I click the window. It didn't focus on the window. Now, the reason for that is because when I right click the entry, the entry has stolen focus in a way where when I click the window, it's not causing the right unblur refocus on the window that I want to happen. Cause there's just this little blur focus fight that happens. Now, what I've just, I, I've tried to fix it for a while and I, I kind of gave up cause it was just giving me such a headache. So the way that I ended up fixing it in the end was to add another capture. So instead of just blurs, I also monitor the window now for click events and basically just handle them exactly the same. So before I was, I was handling the windows focus events, but now I'm also going to handle click events here. And why is it complaining there? I'm going to fix this because it's complaining, but yeah, the, the base, if we show it, I'll show a demo of it now. It's complaining about the types, but it's already working. Probably right click. And now when I click the window, there we go. It took the proper focus. Let's just see if I fix that. Uh, specify allowed title bar above. Hmm. What's it complaining about then? Let's just try to figure out what it's complaining about here. Focus. Oh, I think I need to update the type too. Maybe I did. I overlooked that. Mouse event. Hmm. Oh, I think I, I think I do need to fix that on the move to front piece here. Here, I need to say that it can be a focus event or it can be a react mouse event. And then I think I also need to specify here that if we got to this part, then it was a mouse event on focus capture. Oh, no, no. Then this would be a focus event here. There we go. So the, if it were a mouse event, would it have got here? Hmm. Well, what's focus capture expecting? Yeah, it's expecting to have been past a focus event. Okay, so we'll say that that was in the case of a focus event. May happen in, in other cases, though, to be honest. For the sake of the focus capture, we'll leave it that way. So that stopped the typing here error. And it is true that when you do click, click capture, a mouse event will occur, but a focus capture would be a focus event. So I've now said move target, the event can be either. But then here and here event sometimes gets treated. In this case here, it gets passed on to the focus capture of another callback events. This gets passed on to the window. Let's leave it as is. This, this fixed the types, but there's there's a small chance that this type is in some ways partially not as correct as it could be, for lack of a better word. Let's commit it anyways. What was this? Focus on clicks also. Um, let's just say window will focus windows, window monitors for click focus. That's basically what I was trying to do. Okay, we'll call that one in, in the books as well. That was this here. So what's this one here? Title bar above window content, right? This I think I noticed with the video player that if I took the video player and I shrunk it, its controls were able to get above the title bar. Oh, Currently it has locked aspect ratio. Don't I fix that? Yeah, yeah, I fixed that next, but I think probably that's why I noticed this after. Anyways, the issue is that this title bar here, it can like some, this thing here could go 
if, if I could resize the thing right now up to that point, it would go over top of it. Obviously that should never happen. So let's just say that the title bars position should be relative in the window and it should always be at the top. That will allow it to be over, move up over other things. That will allow it to be over the other things inside the uh, the window. To be more specific there. Sounded vague the way I explained it. Okay, that's the right spot for that. Uh, it's not super testable because uh, that window isn't resizable right now, but we'll test it in the next, the next after the next commit here. Title bar above window content always, without exceptions. Although that being said, there, you probably could find an exception to make that thing not on top. Specify allowed resizing. So yeah, the issue here was with video, not with video player, but video player wasn't able to resize. Let me see it here. Video player right here. I had put locked aspect ratio true because I had set it up in a way where auto resizing only worked when the lock, when the ratio was locked. That was not necessary for video player. I don't care about the aspect ratio being locked for video player. For some apps though, it does matter, such as uh, the V86 or JS-DOS. You don't want the aspect ratio to get messed around there. So we'll take a peek at this commit here and see how I've balanced the books, so to speak. I'm gonna apply the commit. I'm gonna paste this message and I'm gonna see what message I got here. I've got a message here from Doug Moore. But can you open a browser and go to your website in it? Uh, do you mean within my app? Can it open a browser? This is a browser here that has the app, but I guess he's saying Doug maybe is suggesting that there would be another an app like a browser app. Definitely, I could. I, I plan to. I mean, I could do it right here with just editing. You want you want a browser? I can get you a browser. All right. So this thing here, let's just delete that, and then in the v, not in the viewport or it is in the viewport. Yeah, we'll edit the HTML here. Find the header. Where was that header? Hard to find. Header. What is this? this is this like buttons and stuff? Oh, okay. Well, the header's there. I didn't want to edit the header. I wanted to edit inside it. Okay, Doug, Doug means like a browser. Okay, let's try to get a browser in here. Add attribute. I don't want to add an attribute. I want to add a darn element. Why are they making it so hard for me to do? Let's try this. I'm gonna, it's so hard to inspect things when I steal right click all the time. I'm gonna take this OL and I'm gonna just convert it to an iframe here. I'm gonna say the source of the iframe is localhost 3000. Uh, let's see where that gets us. There we go. So there's our, our theoretical browser app. So, I mean, I, I'm going to make a better app. I'm going to have, like, maybe it'll be Chrome-inspired or Firefox-inspired. I don't know. But it's just going to use an iframe. And I'm going to have an address bar. But there's a lot of limitations there that make it tricky because of the way iframes are treated within browsers. So it's going to be hard for me to know what happens in the in this page and to reflect it in the address bar or, or any of that other stuff. But it, it'll be a fun little journey. It's on my board of things to do. So I don't have that one yet. Oh, and it has a lot of anger when I do that. Maybe because I just messed with the, the thing. But yeah, good request. It's definitely on my list. I don't know if you're the same person that commented, but someone commented on this like yesterday too. So I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to move the browser thing onto the whiteboard, onto the, this needs to be done for MVP. Here it is here. This one here, browser, HTML viewer. On the board. So it's not today, but it'll, it'll be done for release. We're going to have the browser. So I didn't realize it was so popular, but I, I seem to be getting lots of requests for it lately. It's actually surprisingly easy. It's just an iframe, but it's once you get into, like I said, the back bar buttons, the back and forward states, the address bar, uh, bookmarks, that kind of stuff will be fun to do. Uh, he's new. It wasn't him that did the original comment. Well, it's much appreciated. Thank you for the comment. And I, I guess I'm getting in that comment a lot lately. So it's, it's definitely going to happen. 
But yeah, let's get back to this commit then. So specify allowed resizing. What I've done here is instead of having this logic where I try to infer that if it's not auto resizing or the aspect ratio is locked, then you resize. I, I don't really even understand what that means. I've, I've made it a lot easier. So enable resizing if the allow resizing Boolean is true and it's not maximized. That makes a lot more sense. So this I just simplified, um, that piece. The next piece here, yeah, I got rid of the lock aspect ratio altogether on the title bar. I don't care about that. Same thing. Instead of having this true auto false lock, or it was the inverted of that last time, I, I'm just basing it on allow resizing. So whether or not we can maximize is, is whether or not we allow resizing, basically. That's the little Boolean swap there. And then in V86, I've disabled resizing now explicitly. Uh, because V86, you just can't resize it. It just messes with the way that it works. Because it's emulating. When it's emulating the OS, it's like this OS is going to be this many pixels by this many pixels. And to try to resize it, it, just, it might work with a graphical one. But the way that it redoes, it does the text-based one, it, it actually makes these elements that don't resize well. Anyways. And then video player, I've disabled the lock aspect ratio and I just added the property. So let's take a peek at it here because I wanted to show you that other title bar fix as well. So when we open the video player here now, now when I, now you see the aspect ratio is not locked. I can move it whatever. And now when I go up here, you see that the controls go, oh, didn't I fix that other thing? What happened? This didn't work the way I expected. Well, that's that was what was not supposed to happen. That was what I thought I'd fixed, but maybe in my panic, I actually glossed over that I did not fix that. Double check this. What happened to that title bar fix? Did I not apply that? That was here. What happened then? Let's take a peek at it. I thought that was what the fix was. So the title bar is the header here. So I have the position now. Relative was not correct. Would it have to be? Hmm. That's weird. What about Z index? I got to wonk with mess with that. Oh, okay. Maybe what happened is when I was doing this, playing with it in the browser, I realized I needed Z index. But then when I committed the code, I never took that Z index change. And I just, and I never tested it again. So Z index was necessary. Now it's, Oh, but it, yeah, let's, let's apply the Z index here in the code. The index of one, let me refresh the page now. Now that change should stay and it should stop doing that. There we go. The title bar. Oh, <laughs> this little piece is still floating. Maybe we just need a higher Z index. Let's see how high of a Z index we need for that little circle to go away. Let's try a thousand. There we go. Oh, even a hundred was enough. Just not one. Oh, two was enough even. Okay. So that looks good. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. But I gotta I gotta set it in my code or else every time I click it wipes that change. So let's try this one last time. There we go. That's how it should look. So I'm per I like that I can make my apps that tiny. Basically, it's just that's as small as the app can be. But at least it's you can see there's this little app here. And then you can make it bigger that way. And you can make it bigger this way to reveal the app. That's better. So that fix is a follow-up. We're not going to do that one. We're going to put that as a separate commit. So let's do this one that we just were talking about. The specify allowed resizing. That stopped the video player from having a locked aspect ratio. And then we're going to do that follow-up commit here where we adjust the Z index. Title bar above window content always. And Z index of title bar above others. A little minor commit there. We'll, we'll tack that one on here. And Z index above others. There we go. Let's go back to what changes are left. So we just did specify allowed. So at this point, we get to the address bar stuff. So this, we don't want to do. What's this one here? This might be something different. Auto select delete text. No, that's the address bar still. Refresh button is, the up is. This maybe is not build type fix. Oh, how'd that sneak in? That's probably wrong. 
Oh, this was that fix I was just discussing that I did. But did this happen? I hope not. I hate when that happens. Ugh, it did again. I hate when that happens. I think what why it happened is because I imported it as focus event and press save and then auto import brought in react. But when it comes to react pieces, I, I much prefer to do react dot for the types. So it's very clear that, oh, okay, you were importing a react. This is a react version. Because the confusing thing is there's a, there is a non react mouse event. That's why I like inline to be like, this is the react one. Anyways, let's just remove that annoying one. Remove react import auto import. Let's say I'm not going to be blamed for that import. That was another minor one that I'm embarrassed even got slipped in. So that was this. Move text one pixel left. Okay, this is another minor one. This was me playing around with Windows and realizing that my text sizing wasn't perfect. This is just like there's on the title bar, there's the icon and the text. And I found with Windows that there's... Because before when I was checking with Windows, there was this little annoying ribbon thing in the middle. And I didn't know how to get rid of that. So I just inferred, oh, it looks like five pixels, you know, from the best measurement. But I found a way to get rid of that ribbon thing. And when Windows doesn't have that in the way, it only does four pixels here. So just always trying to make it pixel perfect. And that's that's the fight, the endless fight, especially when Windows changes it on updates sometimes. It's very rare, but I've noticed a few times where they've either I've measured it wrong or they've changed it. But I'm pretty sure they've changed it because in the video, I have video proof that at one point it was a certain way and then it's another way. The only other fix we got left here is this lint tweaks. What were these? These were minor too. Right, it was complaining about this because icon can possibly be undefined even though in theory it can't in this case because we know MP3 exists. I've just decided to say as string so we know that this is always gonna be a string. Uh, this was inferable so I didn't need to specify those. I moved this JS, this JS file that I need to run via node. I moved it into a folder called scripts to have a scripts folder that Lint ignores because these JavaScript files are just not ideal for Linting. And in that note, I've also removed all the Linting rules from that JavaScript file. And this part, no. Not this yarn file. This is because I was trying to install some new, uh, some more linting rules. That's what brought this brought this change about. But I never perfect, I never got all the fixes in for the linting rules, so I don't want to do the linting piece, the the new linting rules. I just want to tweak those few changes. So we'll we'll change this yarn lock file to say that we didn't change it. Let's get rid of that diff, and we'll just keep the other ones. So let's apply this last diff of the day corrupt patch line 91 isn't that the last nine hmm oh that's the wrong patch what did i do here maybe it wasn't supposed to be b7 maybe it was hmm now I'm not sure which patch file it was. Oh, it was B7. How did I corrupt it? That's weird. Let's re-download it here and just accept that yarn change. And then we'll undo it just in the, in the change file. Oh, I didn't even save a correct patch file that time. Well, the first time I saved it correctly, but I must have messed it up during editing. What's this thing called now? B7, yada, yada, yada. Okay, there's that time it applied without a problem. So let's undo this yarn. Wait, the package thing changed too? Oh yeah, that, that's a fair one, but this one's wrong. Okay, the rest of this is decent. So, so for linting, we're gonna ignore the scripts folder for now on, and we're also gonna ignore config.js files. So those are the three JS files I really had. I had two configs.js, and I had this one script that has to stay JS for the fact that it runs via node. But I moved it into scripts. I got rid of its linting uh, rules here that it had because we don't care about them anymore. Uh, these were This was a, f a fix for the fact that icon could have been undefined, but in this case, we know it's never gonna be undefined. 
And these were just two inferable types. Very minor fixes. So we didn't actually have any big changes this week. The address bar was something I was hoping on, but it never never got around to it. We just did we did a ton of fixes this week, I think. And the app is a lot I, I feel like it's a lot better for it. But yeah, we haven't got the address bar. Mostly just a lot of refactors, a lot of interesting refactors today. I mean, if you look at it, look at this list here. That's actually a big list. We just did four we did 14 more commits. I think I commit I pushed in 26 or something earlier, 20 something or other. Let's push in these 14. Actually yeah, yeah, we can push it in for the heck of it. But I, I have to do another push at the end of the day where I push in these stream notes. Um, that being said, thank you guys for tuning in. And thanks, Doug Moore, for, for the comments. Um, if you like this video, please throw me a like. Uh, if you want to motivate me, you want to keep track of what's going on, subscribe. It, it's recommended. It's a, it's what all the cool kids are doing nowadays. Uh, that that being said, I think that's it. Thanks, thanks again for checking out my video. And I'll see you in the next stream. See you on stream 42. This was 41. Bye for now.